Hey, it is good to be together wherever we're gathered. Lone Tree, Port Lavaca, Cuero, Parkway Victoria, everybody celebrating Father's Day at Parkway Online. It's good to be together because we're in the midst of a series where we are learning from the people who followed Jesus. We're taking an up close and personal look at the men and women who follow Jesus so that we can learn how to follow him too. We learn from Anna, the one who waited on God, the one who waited not just with, like, I'm just throwing in the towel and whatever comes will come, but instead the one who waited with fasting and prayer and worship. We learn how to wait with expectation from Anna. And then last week we learned from the disciple who is like us, the disciple Peter, and how Jesus says, despite what's happened to you, follow me anyway. If you're on a spiritual high with me, following with great devotion, follow me anyway. If you are struggling and sin has captured your heart and your life, follow me anyway. He meets us right where we are and says, follow me anyway. As we continue today, we're going to learn from the life of a disciple named Andrew. And if you've ever lived in the shadow of a sibling, you know a part of Andrew's life. Because Andrew is Peter's brother. And we're going to see throughout Scripture that Peter was big and bold. And sometimes he talked before he thought. And sometimes he got it right. And sometimes he got it wrong. Don't worry, I'm not going to re-preach all of last week's message. But Andrew lived in this guy's shadow. Andrew is also one that I think, there's not personality types listed next to the disciples. But I'm thinking that Andrew was likely an introvert. If his brother Peter was as strong an extrovert as you would find, then we see Andrew, the one that lived in his shadow, and the one that was likely more reserved, the one that noticed things differently than Peter did. So if you've ever thought, I don't know if God could use me based on how I'm wired, You're going to see from Andrew, whether extroverted or introverted, you can be used by God. If you've ever lived in the shadow of your sibling and you're like, would God use me? Perhaps your sibling was great at athletics and high school, all varsity, right? And you rolled in in ninth grade and you were not athletic. You know what it's like to live in the shadow and wonder, will I measure up to people's expectations? Perhaps your sibling was extra smart. They were the valedictorian. And you know what it's like to roll in, to live according to other people's expectations for you based on the shadow in which you live of your sibling. Well, today as we learn from Andrew, I want you to see that Jesus doesn't judge the outside, he judges the heart. And I want you to know that Jesus can use each and every one of us, especially if we learn what Andrew was so good at. If Anna was the one who waited and Peter is the one who's like us, Andrew's the one who notices. He notices spiritual needs. He notices physical needs. He notices what God is doing in the world around him. And God uses him because he's the one who notices. And it's such a cool story and person to dig into today because it's Father's Day. And if fathers can grow in their ability to notice spiritual needs and physical needs, and the times based on what God's word says, then we can all grow to be better fathers. Andrew is going to teach us today how to be a godly man. In fact, his name, Andrew, Andres in Greek, comes from the root word of man. So we are learning about a manly man today. He might have lived in the shadow of his brother. He might be wired as an introvert. But make no mistake about it. The man we're going to learn from today shows us as men how to follow the Lord in very manly ways. He was a professional fisherman, so he was likely strong. He was a professional fisherman who, when he became a follower of Christ, became very zealous for others to know Jesus too, including his brother, Peter. He was a man who lived much of his life in the shadow of his much better known brother. But he was a man of passion for the truth. He was a man of hard work, a man we can learn from today. So let's learn together from Andrew. 
And as we learn from Andrew, I'm going to share some stories from men in our church family that exemplify some of the qualities that we see in Andrew's life. And I think that you and I, as residents in South Texas, can relate to Andrew well. He didn't have to be in the spotlight. He was a behind-the-scenes kind of guy, and yet God used him. It's kind of who we are in South Texas. God, let me do my thing, and you do your thing as you use me. Andrew was comfortable with other people being in the spotlight, other people getting the attention, other people being seen, but he was content with being used by God. There's a humility in Andrew's life that I think the men and women of South Texas can relate to. Because we have a humility that we want to know God and be used by God. And we want to see ourselves used by God in amazing ways where he's placed us. We're pleased like Andrew is to do what God has called us to do. And to do it in a way that impacts the world around us. So we're going to jump into Andrew's life together now. And it begins in the wilderness. See, before Jesus began his public ministry, John the Baptist was out in the wilderness preaching and baptizing people for repentance. And Andrew was a spiritual seeker even before he started following Jesus. Because he left the family fishing business for a moment and went out and became a disciple of John. John was gathering followers so that he could point those disciples to Jesus. And John was out in the wilderness preaching repentance and baptizing people for repentance. He was baptizing people for repentance because the Jewish people needed to do business with God so that when they saw Jesus, they would respond to him by faith. It wasn't their repentance that would save them. It's their faith in Christ and in Christ alone that saves so John was preparing hearts. He was preparing the way for the way to come and for people to believe in him, find life, and then follow him. And so one day while Andrew was out with John and with the others in the wilderness, Jesus arrives. And John sees Jesus come on the scene. He's like, hey, you should be baptizing me. I have no worth to baptize you. But Jesus pressed him, and so John baptized Jesus. And when John dipped Jesus back in the water, as Andrew witnessed it, and John would later testify, there was a dove that came. It was the spirit who came like a dove and sat on Jesus' shoulder. The heavens opened, and God spoke and said, This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. Do what he says. In that one snapshot of Jesus' baptism in the wilderness with the Apostle John and Andrew and other disciples watching, we see a picture of the Trinity. The Father speaks, the Spirit descends, and Jesus is in the water. So as we look at our relationship with God, we can see the relationship that we have with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit is vital to our life, and it's a picture of Jesus' baptism, the vitality we can find when we relate to him. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And as Jesus was baptized, just know this. Jesus wasn't baptized for repentance. Jesus had nothing to repent of ever. So that's why John said, I shouldn't baptize you. You should baptize. You're the perfect one. You're the Lamb of God. So why was Jesus baptized? Jesus was baptized, and Andrew witnessed it, and John would testify to it, so that you and I could do one day what he did. He wasn't baptized for repentance. He was baptized for identification with you and me. So when you believe in Jesus and then you follow him by getting baptized, when you're dipped back in the water and raised back up out of the water, that's exactly what John the Baptist did for Jesus in the Jordan River. It's for identification so we can say, I did what Jesus did. I am following him. Can you imagine that scene? John, the bold prophet, camel, herring, camel hair wearing prophet in the wilderness sees Jesus come, says, I shouldn't baptize you. You should baptize me. Jesus says, nope, you're going to baptize me. Father speaks, spirit descends, son is in the water. Can you imagine that scene, how powerful it is? Well, it was life changing 
for Andrew because he witnessed it. He kept following John until the next day. Listen to what happened next in John 1, verse 35. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. Andrew was one of those. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. And when two disciples heard this, they said, when they heard this, they followed Jesus. Verse 38. Turning around, Jesus saw them and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Jesus said, Come, and you will see. So they went and they saw where he was staying and they spent the day with him. It was about four o'clock in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard what that John had said and who had followed Jesus. I love it. Andrew was one of the first followers of Jesus, and yet he's still introduced as Simon Peter's brother. But he was one of the first followers of Jesus, and get this. John wasn't gathering disciples so he would have a great following. John was gathering disciples so that they would follow Jesus. John said, less of me and more of you, Jesus. What a great strategy for all of our lives. And so Andrew spends an afternoon and an evening with Jesus, and he's convinced that Jesus is the Messiah. And how do you know this? Well, look what he did next, John 1. 41 through 42. The Bible says, The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, We have found the Messiah that is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. One of the things we're going to see in Andrew's life and in the life of everyone who's following Jesus well is that good news about Jesus is too good to contain. It has to be shared. And Andrew loved Peter. Andrew loved his family. And so the first thing he did was share the Messiah with them. It was too good to be kept to himself. And so Peter and Andrew and Jesus knew each other. And then one day, as the story continues on the beach in the Sea of Galilee, we had a version of this last week we see Andrew's calling by Jesus to follow him. And not in a temporary way, but in a forever way. Matthew 4, 18 through 20. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter, and his brother Andrew. Again, Simon, Peter, and Andrew. He's in the shadow. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. F Come, follow me, Jesus said. And I will send you out to fish for people. I'll send you out to fish for men. At once they left their nets and they followed him. Andrew was a man that may have lived in his brother's shadow. Andrew was a man that may have chosen to be behind the scenes instead of in the front speaking boldly for Christ. But he was a man that from this point forward followed Jesus well. And there are glimpses of how God used Andrew's life in the Gospels that I want us to see how God can use our lives as well. And the first thing is that Andrew noticed spiritual needs of people. He was aware of people who were far from Jesus, like his brother Peter, and he wanted to introduce everyone he could to the Savior he believed in, and was now following him. He noticed spiritual needs. One of the things that I know is that godly men and godly women, they notice the needs of people around them, starting with spiritual needs. And Andrew would set the example for other disciples on noticing spiritual needs. We'll see it in a minute. Andrew would be a man that you and I can emulate a man who followed Jesus and trusted Jesus. You and I, as we pray, you and I, as we trust the Lord with our family's needs, we are being men who lead our family spiritually. And we're following in the example of Andrew that says what's done behind the scenes matters. Even if no one knows, I'm gonna keep trusting God. He was a man who set an example. He was a man who trusted the Lord. We'll see that. 
And he was a man who shared the gospel with those that he loved, even those that he didn't even know yet. He was bold with the gospel in an Andrew sort of way. In this Father's Day, can I remind you that if God has blessed you with children, dads, your number one responsibility in their life is to make sure that they know and believe in and are following Jesus. Your first job isn't to teach them how to hit a curveball. Your first job is to teach them who Jesus is. Your first job isn't to teach them how to shoot a deer in the right place. Your first job is to teach them how to follow Jesus wherever he takes them. Your first job isn't to teach her how to be a sweet little lady. Your first job is to teach her how to follow Jesus. That's your first job. And as we see, Andrew noticed spiritual needs. He was eager to introduce people to Jesus because found people find people. Andrew found the Messiah and he wanted everyone to find him. Started with those that were closest to him, but he wasn't limited by loving just those that he knew. He wasn't limited by loving those that were just like him. He wasn't limited at all. In fact, he would go and share his faith and introduce people to Jesus who were outsiders. This was one of the markers of his life. In John 12, 20 through 22, listen to this. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. So here's the scene. The disciples are in Jerusalem for the, the Pentecost festival. Pardon me, not the Pentecost festival, the Passover festival. And as they were preparing for Passover and as the city was filling with others who would come for Passover, some Greek Jews came and said, hey, we want to meet the one that you're following, the one that you believe is the Messiah. And so this is a challenging moment here because there was 12 disciples and Jesus, their message was spreading and others were believing, but here's some outsiders who want to talk to Jesus. Would Jesus just be for us? Would Jesus welcome outsiders? Would Jesus want to talk to those people? The other is, what was their motive to meet with Jesus? Because Jesus, the week of Passover, was hailed as Hosanna on Sunday and crucified on Friday. What if these Greeks have wrong intentions for our Savior? What should you do? And that's why Philip was confused and he came to Andrew and said, what should we do? Andrew did what Jesus called him to do. He became a fisher of men right there in that moment. He said, it doesn't matter that they're outsiders. We can trust Jesus with their motives. Let's introduce them to the Savior. Let's introduce them to the one that we are following. Here's a principle. It's very easy to identify the differences between us and others. Jesus doesn't call us as disciples to be men and women who notice the difference and segregate ourselves. Jesus calls us and equips us as we share the gospel with others to be men and women who see our common need for Christ. When you know that every tribe and tongue needs the Savior, Jesus, you stop noticing difference and you start trying to figure out how can I introduce these different people to Jesus, the one that can save them, to Jesus, the one that I am following. When you stop noticing differences and start noticing our common need for Jesus, then you start seeing spiritual needs. We have a man in our church that is gonna be horrified that I'm using him as, a, as an example right now. But we have a man that has lived his whole life Instead of noticing the differences between him and those that he was ministering to, instead of noticing the difference, he decided to share the gospel. 
when he was a BSM director on campus at Sam Houston State. Rick Smith, he wasn't a college student, but he loved them and wanted to share his faith with them. So he entered into their world. I'm different than you, but you need Jesus and I can lead you to Jesus, to believe in him and to follow him. Then Rick and his wife, Bonnie, so faithfully served the Lord in Central Asia. Let me tell you, not a lot of people named Rick and Bonnie in Central Asia. Such a different world. And yet they didn't notice the difference alone. They stepped into the difference to share the gospel. And then upon their retirement, they returned to Victoria to care for family and to be used by Jesus because there is no retiring from kingdom work. And so Rick looked around for a few years and said, what is God going to do to help me reach those that are different than me? How am I going to do what I do to see the common need for Jesus even with people that are different than me? And that's when he started in English as a second language ministry to teach men and women how to speak English, most of whom speak Spanish. But the goal isn't just that they would learn English, but instead that they would know Jesus. And I share Rick's story because I think that's the heart of Andrew in this story. There's no such thing as an outsider when you believe that every man, woman, and child needs Jesus. There's no such thing as a difference that Jesus can't overcome if you believe that the gospel is the solution. And Andrew teaches us how to be found people who find people. Disciples who are on mission to tell others about Jesus. And one of the things that I know about my life and as I look at how Rick has ministered over the decades is that we share our faith not just from a platform, but we share our faith on a personal level. Father to son, father to daughter, mother to daughter, mother to son. We share it friend to friend. We share it coworker to coworker. We share our faith in relationships. And that's why Andrew was so good at it. Peter might have been great in a crowd, but Andrew was great personally with people. You want to meet Jesus? I can take you to him. You want to meet Jesus? Let me share the gospel with you, and you can find hope in him. So Andrew noticed the spiritual needs of people. Andrew also noticed the physical needs of people. He's a man that lives the principle that we preach and try and live around here on the daily, and that's to see a need and meet a need. He was able to see a need that people had and not be overwhelmed by it, but instead trust Jesus, that Jesus could work and move to provide for the people. And it's the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. In John chapter 6, verses 5 through 9, listen to how Andrew saw a need and wasn't overwhelmed by it, saw a need and trusted Jesus with it. John 6, 5 through 9. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread For all of these people to eat. He asked this only to test him, for he had in mind what he was going to do. Peter said to Jesus, It'll take more than a half year's of wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, once again, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? So we've got Philip who's like, Jesus, I don't know how we're going to feed this crowd. For everybody to take one bite, it'd be a half year's wages or more. You've got other disciples like, I'm sure this, there's no way we could feed them. And then you've got Andrew who's working the crowd person by person. And he sees a boy who's packed a lunch and he says, hey, can I have that? to take to Jesus. I don't know how so many people could eat off of this boy's lunch, but I believe that there's nothing that's insignificant if I take it to Jesus. And that's exactly what he did. And Jesus blessed that food and fed the crowd, and there were baskets full of food left over. 
All because Andrew noticed the boy with the food and trusted Jesus to meet his and everyone else's needs. Everyone else was worried and wondered, how could these people be fed? Andrew paid attention and trusted Jesus. On Father's Day, man, I hope you know this. You don't have to have all the answers for your family. There are things that your family will bring to you that are overwhelming, that are disheartening, and you wonder, how am I going to lead them through this? Andrew shows us how. Take it to Jesus. Trust the Lord. Encourage those that you love to put their faith in the Lord right along with you. We do what Andrew did. We take our needs to Jesus and we do what Anna did. We wait on the Lord to move with prayer and fasting and with worship. That's what we do to lead our families well. Man, you don't have to have all the answers. You can't, but you can take all the questions to Jesus. John MacArthur says this, it's not the greatness of the gift that counts, but rather the greatness of the God to whom it's given. So while you're searching for all the answers and you're searching for how all the needs will be met and all you have is a little bit, offer all that you have to the God of the universe. It's not the size of the offering that matters before God, but the size of the God who receives the gifts, the life that we bring to him. There's another man in our church that is amazing at noticing physical needs. I think Johnny is a secret servant of Jesus. Johnny Monreal will hold a door to help you feel welcome at church. Johnny Monreal will get out and rip out concrete so that parking lots are safe. Johnny will serve behind the scenes with a group of men who served yesterday to put in a ramp for a family he didn't even know yet. Johnny's a secret servant of Christ. And why is that? Because he notices needs and refuses to think God can't use me to meet that need. He just offers himself to the Lord each and every day and said, Lord, use me. And there's a group of brothers that serve right alongside with them and encourage him and are encouraged by him. Like, Mike, I think I'd like to be a part of a group like that. A group of men that go out and build ramps. A group of men that go out and do Andrew, manly man type things. If you're a man that would like to be included on the project team. Email serve at parkwaychurch.tv and we'll keep you in the loop on projects and things that happen where men are noticing physical needs and going to meet them in the name of Jesus. Because nothing is insignificant in the hands of Jesus. Even six hours on a Saturday can change a life. My life in your hands, Lord. That's my strategy for living. So Andrew noticed spiritual needs. Andrew noticed physical needs, putting what he had into the hands of Jesus. Andrew also noticed the truth and the times. There was a time when Jesus was preparing for his death, burial, and resurrection. And as he was teaching the disciples, he predicted that the temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed that the house of God would be torn down. And just so you know, just as Jesus predicted, the temple was demolished, the house of God was torn down. But listen to what Andrew and his friends as disciples did to learn more from Jesus. Because Andrew was a spiritual seeker before he knew Jesus and after he was following Jesus. Mark 13, three through four. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, tell us these things, when will, they, when will these things happen? And what will be a sign that they're about to be fulfilled? You know what I think happened right here? Jesus teaches and says, hey, this temple is gonna be torn down. You see it over there? It's gonna be gone, torn down, house of God, destroyed. Everybody else heard it. 
I think Andrew walked away thinking about it. And he goes to his brother, who's close friends with James and John. Peter, James, and John being the inner circle that Jesus lived closely with. I think Andrew went to Peter, James, and John and said, hey, did y'all just catch what he said? Oh yeah, it's gonna be awesome. Temple's gonna be torn down, it's gonna be mighty war, battle's gonna be awesome. Sad, but awesome. And Andrew's like, don't you think we should ask a follow-up question? So when's that going to happen? What should we be looking for? He was a student of the truth and the times. And I think we typically have a bias towards one or the other. We typically have a bias for the truth, or we have a bias for the times. We are so committed to our doctrine that we don't realize how our doctrine impacts our daily or we're so committed to our daily or the concerns of our nation, the temporary, that we forget the need for truth. But Andrew was interested not only in truth, but in timing. So I look at our lives, men and women, and I challenge us to be students of God's word who also look out at our world to see how God is fulfilling what he's doing so that we trust him and we're not full of despair, so that we can share the gospel, the reason for the hope that we have based on what's happening in the world. There are a couple men in our church family that amaze me with their commitment to truth and to the times. Darian Amarajado worships in our Lone Tree location. And Darian is a young man who actively learns truth so that he can disciple other men. And he and Susan actively learn truth so that they can be a couple of influence in their peer group. I look at Darian and he's a student of the word and a student of truth so that he can disciple people in our day and age. We need men and women who are students of the truth that are committed to discipling others in our day and age. That's how we lead spiritually. And then we've got a man in our church who has been a greeter for years, years and years. He shakes hands, he welcomes people to church, he encourages me, and he's on his 24th reading of the Bible, through and through, year after year. I asked him this morning, I said, hey, how many times have you read through the Bible? He said, 24, it's just a habit of mine. I'm in Judges right now. And he doesn't read it for public acclaim. He reads it because his life is marked by the truth and the times. And what's amazing about the pursuit of Scripture over time is that as you read it 24 times, year by year, over and over, you see that God's Word addresses every time, every season, every need that we have right then and right now. So I encourage you to be men and women who are like Andrew, who notice spiritual needs, who notice physical needs, and are committed to be students of the truth who are also students of our time. Because if you do that, even if you live in the shadow of your older brother, even if you don't have a personality that makes it comfortable for you to stand up in front of others. Andrew never preached a sermon as recorded in Scripture. And yet he impacted lives because he introduced people to Jesus and met physical needs in the name of Jesus and sought to live his faith and his day and his age in a way to please and honor the Lord. He never preached a sermon, but his life preaches a message. There is hope in Jesus. Follow him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the chance to open your word and to learn and grow together today. God, help us to live what we're learning and to apply truth to our life. God, may we not just come and learn and go, but may we come and learn and be changed and live what we're learning. God, I thank you for the example of men and women throughout our church who serve you well and who notice spiritual needs and who notice physical needs and who are students of the scripture and students of our day. God, I thank you. But God, may you multiply our number in this body. May we see ourselves 
as spiritual leaders of our families, spiritual leaders of our church, spiritual leaders of our community. God, even if we never preach a sermon, may our life preach the gospel of Jesus. Church, as you pray, pray that the Lord would use you like he used Andrew. Pray that the Lord would use you to notice spiritual needs. If you have people that you love that don't know Jesus and you know it, pray for them right now. And pray for an open door to share the gospel with them. If your kids don't know Jesus yet, pray for them and share your faith with them. What a great Father's Day gift you could give them. The gospel explained and lived by their parents and accepted by the kids. What a Father's Day gift you could give. Pray that you would notice physical needs so that we can point people to Jesus. Pray that you would continue to be a seeker of God even after you've believed in Jesus. As we continue to pray, if today was your day to commit to follow him, that's one commitment. But maybe you're here today and you've never put your faith in Christ. Your commitment isn't to follow him. Your commitment is to believe and to find life. So if you've come today and you've heard that Jesus loved you enough to take care of your sin problem, he died on the cross for you, was raised again from the dead. If you've the gospel shared, it's pierced you in the heart, you say, I believe. I believe that I'm a sinner who needs a savior and that Jesus is the only savior, I believe. Today's your day to believe. Let's mark that moment of your belief with a prayer that you can pray. Jesus, I believe. I believe that I'm a sinner who needs a savior and that you are the savior of the world. Thank you for coming for me, for dying in my place and being raised again from the dead. Today, I believe. Thank you for giving me life. As we continue to pray, if you just put your faith in Jesus, you're a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. Your sins have been forgiven. Heaven is your forever home. And now your mission in life is to become like Jesus, to pursue him, to share him, to live your life to honor him. And if today was your day to believe, let somebody know. Tell that friend that brought you. Use a response card in front of you. Or stop by the information center at your location and pick up a new believer's kit. There's a Bible and some other resources to help you growing in your walk with Christ. Father, we thank you for what you're up to in the life of our church. We pray that you would use all of it. God, I pray that as we give our lives and our offering, that you would meet every need of your church. God, that you would encourage us as we play our part. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.